One of our favorite things to investigate here at Oddities Observed are some of the most haunted sites here in Asheville, North Carolina. Western North Carolina is home to many nationally recognized haunts and legendary supernatural phenomena. And Asheville seems to be a hotbed for many of these stories. Ghosts love to lurk around the antebellum brick homes, century-old hotels, and crumbling cemeteries. As voted online and echoed by many Ashevillians, Helen's Bridge may be the most haunted site in Asheville. Located on Bowcatcher Mountain, the bridge is rooted in legend and is known for many unexplainable occurrences. Helen's Bridge is one place where the paranormal activity appears to occur so frequently you are likely to have a haunted experience of your own. Helen's Bridge was originally known as Zealandia Bridge, as it served as the entrance to Zealandia Castle, home of John Evans Brown. Modeled after Haddon Hall in England, John Evans Brown built for himself a mansion on Bowcatcher Mountain in 1889, and he named it Zealandia in honor of his second home in New Zealand. The mansion and property have their own storied histories, but for this tale, we will be focusing merely on the approach bridge just to the south. The home and bridge were designed by well-known Asheville architects R.S. Smith, who was the field architect for the Biltmore House, and his partner Albert Heath Carrier. The arched bridge is made of quarried stone and was constructed in 1909 to provide access to the nearby Zealandia mansion via carriage. It is reported that author Thomas Wolfe had often walked under the bridge as a boy and that the bridge was referenced in his 1929 novel, Look Homeward Angel, when the main character, Eugene, walks with his girlfriend up Bowcatcher Mountain. They turn from the railing with recovered wind and walk through the gap under Philip Roseberry's great arched bridge. To the left, on the summit, the rich Jew had his cattle, his stables, his horses, his cows, and his daughters. As they went under the shadow of the bridge, Eugene lifted his head and shouted. His voice bounded against the arch like a stone. They passed under and stood on the other side of the gap, looking from the road's edge down into the cove. But they could not yet see the cove, save for green glimmers. The bridge was almost demolished in 1976 when it was decided to make the cut through Bowcatcher Mountain for Interstate 240. While the bridge itself was not in the path of the construction, it was feared that the shock waves from the blasting of the granite rock in the mountainside would cause damage or a full collapse. Scaffolding and blasting supports were then added to stabilize the bridge. In 1998, with the support still in place and stones falling out from time to time, the city again considered demolishing the structure, citing repairs would take nearly $350,000. Local historians and preservationists banded together once more to help protect the bridge. Several load tests were conducted to see if the arch bridge had suffered any damage in the intervening years, but it was found to be structurally sound, receiving only minor repairs, shoring up some of the stonework and mortar joints, costing only $70,000, with $40,000 supplied by private donors. The wooden bracing was then carefully removed, and by June of 1999, the bridge was brought back to its full glory as it stands today. In November of 2005, the city of Asheville approved a land swap, thus acquiring the bridge in hopes to one day develop a greenway along the ridges of Bowcatcher Mountain. This project has been pushed back multiple times, is currently listed as shovel-ready but pending funding, and is not scheduled to be built until 2024. There are several variations of this tale, which have been handed down for seemingly generations. In each and every tale, they center around a woman named Helen, of a terrible tragedy, and how she haunts the bridge to this day. Helen was believed to have been a woman who lived with her beloved daughter, either in the mansion or in a home nearby. Helen was a single mother in her late 30s, who had recently started some new chapter in her life. One evening, while cooking dinner, Helen's house caught fire. She ran up the stairs to save her daughter, but she fell unconscious from the smoke and collapsed. 
firefighters were able to get to the pair and pull them out of the burning building. Although they were able to resuscitate Helen, they were unfortunately unable to save the life of the young girl. An alternate version of this tale is that Helen's daughter had snuck into Zealandia Mansion when a freak fire broke out where she lost her life. The story continues that Helen deeply mourned the death of her child, consumed by grief. Helen was so distraught that one night soon after, she went out into the woods where she came to Zealandia Bridge. It was here she was said to have hung herself. It is here that she remains to this day, connected to the bridge, her anguish preventing her from moving on from this world. The legend continues that she has made her presence known ever since. Many locals have their own stories about Helen's Bridge, ranging from the slightly creepy to the downright unbelievable. Some have tried to conjure Helen by calling for her while standing beneath the bridge under the very spot where she met her end. They say that, on a full moon, or on certain nights such as Halloween night, if you call for her three times by saying, Helen, come forth, she will appear. A few folks have claimed to see her walking along the roadway, or to be peering out of the woods across the mountaintop. She's said to be wearing a long, old-fashioned white gown. Her hair is long and dark, and her skin is very pale. And she asks people who wander near, Have you seen my daughter? If you answer no, she silently drifts away. Dozens of residents have claimed to have also experienced car troubles at the bridge. When they try to leave, they find their vehicle is suddenly unable to start. Then they feel an approaching danger as if someone is drawing closer and closer until the car surges to life again and they're able to make a safe getaway. Most of the time, this is only temporary trouble. Although some motorists have found their car batteries to have been stricken completely dead, even on the following day. It's not only Helen that's made her presence known here. There are other stories of strange and dark apparitions that have been seen all around the area. People have described seeing a monster-like figure lurking behind the brush and from deep in the forest. This dark presence is not as harmless as Helen, however. Witnesses reported feeling as if they were being attacked or scratched by something from out of nowhere. No one knows where this different spirit came from, only that its intentions are more malevolent. Because of the age of the story, it's hard to identify the true origin of the tale of Helen. The tale has allegedly been spread from person to person for over 50 years, appearing in news publications as an already established haunt in the mid-1990s. The accuracy of this legend is highly debatable, though there have been many other crisscrossing accounts which may have led to the development of this story as we know it today. A U.S. Department of the Interior report on the Zealandia Mansion reveals that there have been no accounts of anyone on the property dying in a fire. However, a subsequent owner of the property, Philip S. Henry, did have a wife who died in a fire. It was in New York in 1903 when Miss Florine Henry lost her own life by suffocation in an early morning fire as she attempted to save her children. Mr. Henry and the two young daughters were saved, including most of the house staff, but Florine Henry and one of their servants died in the flames. Mr. Henry then left New York City and purchased the Zealandia estate where he resided until his death in 1933. Also, there was a suicide that happened connected to the property in 1906. A 25-year-old servant and valet in the employ of Mr. Henry for the previous three years, named James Monnery, was found dead in a room in the old Hazard Mansion by some of his fellow employees. Henry also owned this building where Monnery had his sleeping quarters. The coroner found that the young man had taken his life with a 32 caliber revolver, shooting himself through the right temple. The suicide was found to be quite strange as Monnery was said to have been very well liked and that there did not appear to be any reasons for his rash act. Although a number of other workmen were on the property earlier that same morning, no one heard a pistol fire. There was also a fire that happened on the property in 1981. 
Mr. Henry had doubled the size of the house when he purchased it in 1904, including building a three-story Tudor-style carriage house and stables. Over time, as the property changed hands, this building was left mostly vacant and was considered to be turned into a dinner theater in 1975. Firemen found the landmark structure ablaze when they arrived around 6.30 in the morning on April 17th, battling the fire with four engine companies for an hour before it subsided. Investigators found evidence that a flammable liquid had been used to start and accelerate the fire. The fire was contained to the carriage and stables, leaving only the stone foundation behind. 20-year-old George Wayne Coppage, who police had questioned and released, was later found to be a suspect once the evidence indicated arson. Coppage was also charged with possession of stolen property. The current owner of the property lived in Indiana and was not present when the fire occurred and there were no reports of anyone losing their lives in the blaze. As for the name Helen, there appear to be three possible sources. Some researchers suspect that it may have something to do with Asheville's most notorious murder, that of Helen Clevenger. Helen, a 19-year-old college student, was found beaten and shot to death in her room at the Battery Park Hotel in 1936. Her murder was pinned on a young hall boy at the hotel, whom many believe was completely innocent of the crime. It is suggested that the specter we call Helen is actually the spirit of Helen Clevenger, still seeking justice for her murder. The old Battery Park Hotel building sits approximately one mile from Helen's Bridge. Then there's also a connection to Thomas Wolfe's novel, Look Homeward Angel. In the story, Wolfe had written about Zealandia Bridge, although not by name, and his story did also contain in it a young woman named Helen. Helen was Eugene's sister, who was dealing with a tumultuous relationship with her mother, Eliza. But here, the roles are reversed, as Helen is the daughter, not the mother, and neither of them dies in a fire or by suicide. She was an important character within the book, representing a caretaker of her family even as a child, and her name may have some level of resonance as a result. Third, there is also a nearly identical haunted tale in Royal Pines, located in southern Buncombe County, less than 10 miles from Helen's Bridge. This story claims that as far back as possibly the early 1800s, a woman named Helen and her daughter lived in a cabin on the mountain, and one night, a man broke in and tried to assault Helen. In the struggle from the attack, a kerosene lantern was knocked over and the whole cabin burned down, killing both Helen and her daughter. The legend continues that if you go near to where the home once stood in Royal Pines and you call out, Helen come forth three times, she may appear. Those who have seen her said that she emerges either as a woman-shaped figure made out of the mist or as an angry ball of flame chasing you away and back down the mountain. Then, as you try to escape, she will leave burned handprints on the back of your car. There was a renewed interest in the legend in 1964 when a dozen Henderson County youths claimed to have seen Helen very clearly. It was reported in the newspaper that this sighting prompted locals to gather in large groups, searching all over the mountain around Royal Pines for an experience of their own. These two stories, Helen's Mountain and Helen's Bridge, appear to be something of an intersection of similar folklore, either as a combination of two legends, or that one had inspired the other. However, it is unclear which came first, or at what point the stories diverged, but it is possible that the legends of Helen's Bridge could be based on much older legends of Helen on the mountain. It is suspected that pieces of all of these stories, from Florence Henry and James Monnery to Helen Clevenger and Helen Gant, may have been combined over subsequent retellings of the tales for many, many years, celebrating the oral traditions of the Southeast, creating the urban legend as we know it today. The sheer volume of stories and similarities and phenomena are part of what make this location so unique. Regardless of whether or not the tale of Helen's Bridge is accurate, this does not take away from the authenticity of the haunted nature of the area. While most haunted bridges cause trouble when you're only present on the bridge, visitors to Helen's Bridge have blamed the haunting for many strange occurrences long after they have left Boquetra Mountain. For many, it seems that something is happening here with some level of consistency. With such a high level of supernatural activity, 
journalists, authors, and paranormal investigation crews have visited this bridge numerous times on dark and foreboding nights just to see if they can catch a sight of Helen, and many have walked away with paranormal experiences of their own. The environment around the area certainly has a creepy feeling about it. The bridge is small, but it is high arching over the road, with the old stones and dirt of the ridges showcasing roots and vines beneath. Foolhardy visitors have tried to climb up along the hillside where the dirt and rocks are loose, which can quickly cause a fall back down to the roadway below. The pass itself is very narrow. And don't forget that this is a public road, so visitors will need to be very careful of oncoming vehicles who may drive through the area too quickly. The overpass on top is also very narrow, as it was only designed to support smaller horse-drawn carriages. The walls of the bridge are very short and do not provide much protection to keep an absent-minded tourist from tumbling over the edge, so navigating the entire area should be done with great awareness and vigilance. Another danger is the human element. This is a very popular legend, so you will not likely be alone in the area for long as other thrill seekers will come looking to test the folklore. Expect higher visitation during a full moon, summer break, and definitely on Halloween. Keep in mind also that the bridge sits on a public road and along private property, but it also has a couple of unmarked trails. A greater danger here could be other transient people walking through wishing not to be disturbed or by reckless thrill seekers looking to have a good laugh at someone else's expense. Most people are only there to get an innocent buzz from the idea of having their own paranormal experience but never visit alone and always be mindful of your surroundings. Maybe Helen is there at the bridge destined to haunt the structure as long as it stands, her deep grief anchored to the spot and resonating from the old stones. Maybe the bridge and the mountain harbor other dark entities that are itching for a chance to make their presences known. There are many who have dared to see just what would happen when they tempted fate, and many who have their own tales to share. But remember, locals who have visited before will precaution you to be respectful Helen is known for having a bit of a temper.